Good morning, I'm Jason Ponton. I'm currently a venture capitalist at Flagship Pioneering. Uh, but for many years, I was the editor-in-chief and publisher of MIT Technology Review. Rick and I go back more than 20 years. Yeah. He is the most serial, serial entrepreneur I know. And the vice president and I first met each other almost 20 years ago as well, in his previous life, when I interviewed him for Red Herring Magazine, when he was um, doing something else. I'm going to spend about 20 minutes just talking about a few things that I find interesting. I wanted to start with Mr. Gore. You are one of the most astute technology watchers I know. And I would be fascinated to understand what technologies you believe will have the largest global impact, not just in five years, but to push you in 10 years. Well, over the next uh, five to 10 years, um, a whole suite of technologies that uh, sharply reduce the emissions of greenhouse gases will be the most important mm -hmm. technologies. That's my view. I think that the general recognition of this uh, global emergency um, is proceeding apace. Uh, we're almost at the political tipping point. Uh, the Paris Agreement of December 2015 was a, a significant step forward. Of course, we are challenged here in the United States uh, right now with a dysfunctional uh, political system, but uh, I, I expect that uh, uh, challenge to be overcome, and I would expect that uh, in the early part of 2021, uh, there will be the unleashing of new policy innovations that uh, will be extremely important. Now, within um, that suite of technologies, artificial intelligence is clearly uh, uh, picking up uh, the pace uh, quite dramatically. Uh, I don't know um, the time frame uh, for artificial general intelligence, but I'm relatively certain it's not within the 10-year window yeah. you've asked about. I, I, is it in the 40-year the window? Pr probably. Um, I think uh, quantum computing is likely within the five, I, I think that's likely to emerge within the five to 10-year window that you're, uh, you're asking about. Uh, and, and I think that's going to have a profound impact. Um, but to, to finish my response uh, to you, I think that um, often we focus on individual technologies and, and don't look at the, the ecosystem of technologies that emerge. And mm. I think what, we're see, what, what we've seen now, we're seeing happen right before our eyes, is the emergence of what you might call Earth Incorporated with a <laughs> very uh, uh, densely uh, hyper-connected global economy um, that is challenging all of the political concepts that we've had since the uh, um, uh, emergence of the nation state. And simultaneously, because of the networking uh, of our world, we're seeing the emergence of what you call, might call the global mind. And this uh, interplay between Earth Incorporated and the global mind uh, meaning uh, the expression of collective conscience and the emergence of uh, collective thinking to identify challenges and insist upon the uh, in, in insertion of human values in, in the way we proceed. This, uh, this interplay, I think, is going to be the most important drama of the next, during the next five to 10 years, certainly, and beyond. Well, that, that's so interesting. That's a revolution in how human beings have traditionally interacted. You spoke of policy innovations. Will we need new regulatory regimes to manage that world you're imagining? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yes, of course. Uh, you, you know, when we saw, I mean, there's a great deal of discussion just to pick one uh, of the emergent challenges, and that is the qu question of whether or not uh, um, uh, the, the long-held uh, consensus that automation uh, creates more jobs than it displaces, uh, the, the uh, 
uh, the Luddite fallacy, as economists refer to it, whether that still holds true uh, in, in an age where we are now technologi technologically extending not only uh, physicality, but, but also uh, um, uh, thought processes. Uh, and the early evidence over the last five years indicates that the Luddite fallacy may no longer be mm -hmm. true. Uh, so how, what, what kind of policy changes will have to emerge? You hear discussion of a guaranteed income, all, all of that stuff. I don't know how I feel about that. But I do think that the, the, uh, the dividing line between uh, private and public uh, is likely to, to, sh to shift a bit because we have uh, no shortage of work that needs to be done in areas like child care and health care and mental health care and environmental mm -hmm. cleanup and family services. But these jobs that are uh, now burdened with chronic underinvestment uh, have been seen in the, in the public sector. Mm -hmm. But at, if we do indeed see uh, a, a large-scale hollowing out of employment in multiple verticals simultaneously, uh, then uh, instead of a, a government guaranteed income, there may instead be uh, a, a, a set of new policies uh, to compensate people for doing all of the work that desperately needs to be done now, mm -hmm. uh, it, but uh, with new sources of uh, revenue for uh, compensating that work. Uh, Rick, I have been a fan of desktop metal since the very beginning. Uh, we wrote about them at Red Herring. We've been following Ellie for 20, 30 years. Jonah is an old friend as well. If the revolution that you're imagining were a reality, if mass production 3D printing were possible on a global scale, what types of innovation would that unleash? And what types of different products can you imagine? Yeah, I think that, that uh, building on what Al was, was saying with artificial intelligence, uh, it's going to be led by design uh, in, in one vector, uh, because you'll be able to have computers do better or aid the design at, of the engineer to a completely new level. You have somebody who would have been a CAD draftsman instead of an engineer be able to do better design than the best engineer today. Uh, because instead of spending all your time in the sketcher doing straight lines and extrusions, you actually will spend the time on the logic behind the part. What are the constraints? What vibration is it supposed to have? What are the loads? What type of heat? All the multi-physics that are behind a part. You'll understand that. And then the computer will do the calculations for you to come up with the geometry. And then you do your validation. So it'll be a different uh, workflow than, than what's mm. being done today. And, and all the CAD companies are working on enabling this. Uh, if you look at the cover of Modern Machine Shop, which the machinist is usually a fellow that used to make helicopter parts. And it's in, you know, six, average machinist is like 60 plus years old today. So it's an apprenticeship type business. Um, and uh, you know, the cover of Modern, uh, of Modern Machine Shop is about generative design this month. So there's a pent up demand and an education that's happening. And those parts cannot be made with conventional machining. You need 3D printing. So uh, there'll be adoption of this new mode of, of technology. But to answer your question, once you start to make parts this way, which you can do with our production system, which is just the first system that actually lets you make parts cheaper than casting, under 100,000 units. And over time, this technology will get faster and more productive. And what you'll see, in my opinion, over the next couple of decades is a re-engineering of the supply chain. We have one customer, uh, Caterpillar, who has visions of putting these in each one of their dealers around the world so they can print spare parts on demand. And, and that inventory of one architecture lets you uh, essentially create a fourth mode of supply chain. We have three modes of supply chain. Uh, today, which is land, sea, and air. And we make parts in locations where you have competitive advantages because of tooling and CapEx investment that made one location and one factory gave it lower cost to make a specific part. And, and then you build an HR know-how around that, around that uh, moat. And then 
you have a competitive advantage and then you ship your parts around the world and then countries say it's unfair that you, you can make it cheaper so I'm going to give you tariffs and then you have VAT, et cetera. And that's how kind of the global economy works today. Uh, imagine a world where the parts are digital and you, the factory that makes jet engines can also make gas turbines and can also make uh, um, you know, MRI components because they're all printed in the same machine. And in the same build where you may be building a jet engine part, you're also building a part for an MRI machine at the same time. And, so, uh, and then you're doing the final assembly for your local market and you can do mass customization for the local market. And so I think there'll be, like, like what Al alluded to, a Cambrian explosion of design because uh, you'll have more freedom in the shapes that you can make and, and the products will be differentiated by design and, and not so much by uh, other, other factors. So. This is a good question for the partner meeting. Will that require a revolution in education as well? Because you're asking designers and manufacturers and entrepreneurs to think in a fundamentally different way about it's, possibility. It's no more different than what happened over the last uh, 30 years. Uh, a lot of the partners here, how many of you guys sell SolidWorks or some of the modern 3D uh, tools for design? About half, 3D in CAD, believe it or not, has only like 50% penetration after all these years. A lot of people still use 2D AutoCAD, maybe not in the more advanced countries, but so it takes time for these transitions to happen. But it's no more different than that transition. And you, it's like going to the desert and eventually you have to wander for 40 years before you get to <laughs> the to promised land. Every kid in school today, uh, in engineering school, learns how to use CAD in 3D. And so when they come out, then they get into the, it's, uh, then they go into the workforce and they bring CAD with them. Well, guess what? The number one tool being taught in, the, the tools being used in EDU today, uh, if, if I, when I go to MIT and I see Professor John Hart here, uh, in his class, they teach using Onshape, for example. They Onshape picked uh, uh, 40,000 uh, new EDU seats, I think it was in September of last year, when it, last time I talked to John. And so you have students learning this approach. Autodesk 360, which has generative design built in, is also very heavily used in the EDU sector. And now you have the new version of SolidWorks has generative tools and topology optimization built in. So all of these tools are starting to get this generative capability. This is the type of stuff that students want to print. You go and see a, a student Formula SAE race car team. They have parts that are 3D printed and they're sort of generative looking. And then they'll go to their employers three years from now, two years from now, one year from now, four years from now, and they'll teach the, the fellow that had been doing simple shapes for a long time, hey, look at this generative thing. Yeah. And then you, you look at it 10 years from now and everybody's gonna be doing, so if you think about things go in aesthetics. In the 60s we had that like googie architecture that looked everything like the Jetsons and then the 70s things looked different, the 80s things looked different. I think the 2020s are gonna have this generative look as like the futuristic look. And you see it today when you go to the trade shows and you see bionic design, uh, one of our car automakers, uh, BMW folks, has a part, their aesthetic for the vehicles, like in the 2021, 2020 timeframe, starts to incorporate in the interior this generative look. Once you start to do that, and it becomes like the way things should look, your ski bindings are gonna look generative. Your, you know, all these components are gonna look generative, and the old flat shapes are gonna look like the old stuff, so. And if I could build on uh, Rick's answer, uh, there, there's often, you know, a discussion about the difference between uh, uh, supply push and demand pull, and I think you're going to have demand pull mm -hmm. for new education approaches. Ellie's uh, redesigning engineering education in his own way at uh, MIT right now, but these young kids uh, are, are going to be uh, pulling it to, into common currency. Let me give you a specific example that links uh, the speculation about the pace of this revolution with what I was discussing earlier about the need for it to help solve the climate crisis. Uh, this is a kind of a, a, a self-interested example because it involves a, uh, an electric bus a company called Proterra. Uh, I'm biased, but I think it's by far the, the, the best in the world. 
Well, you look around the world today, and you have, particularly in developing countries, these enormous traffic jams, l huge amounts of pollution. People want to move out of these fast-growing cities because their kids can't breathe. Uh, and, and you have electric mass transportation options. What, are, are we going to ship on, uh, on, uh, on, on boats for, uh, these new electric buses? What about uh, putting these assembly facilities in, in Nairobi, in, uh, in, in Durban, uh, uh, et cetera, in, in the other places where they have this desperate, urgent need? There's going to be such a demand to accelerate uh, the adoption of these new processes. It's going to push everybody involved in the supply chain. But I, I think it's going to be faster than people think. Uh, look at what happened with uh, LEDs, a commonly used example. But uh, Rick Run uh, is on the board of one of the uh, manufacturing panels at uh, the World Economic Forum. Um, I, I, I spent a lot of time there. I spoke with the uh, Minister of Transformation in India uh, just a couple weeks ago. They consolidated bids for new lighting for the national government, some of the state governments controlled by that political party, uh, and, and some cities. And the bid came in at 1 15th the cost uh, uh, offered by the competition, 1 15th. Well, when, when the advantage begins to grow to that mm. scale, then, you know, all bets are off. Um, I'm going to ask one final question to the Vice President, a question for both the panelists. Um, the Vice President has been remarkably restrained, but if you want to see a barn burner of a speech, watch uh, Al's last TED Talk. What do you think are the technologies that will have the largest impact on either capturing carbon or reducing carbon, and you can say 3D printing if you want. Yeah. <laughs> well, the you know the emerging success stories are in um, uh, the revolution in um, the generation of electricity. We have a, a huge secular trend toward the electrification of most things, uh, and there are these heaven-sent alternatives, quite literally, uh, the sun and the wind as sources of electricity that. Uh, now produce electricity cheaper in most geographies than the burning of fossil fuels. Secondly, uh, the, the emergence of uh, cost reduction curves in, in energy storage, principally batteries, but other technologies as well, which complement the um, alternative generation of electricity. Then you have the electrification of transportation. I mentioned buses, but every automobile manufacturer in the world is now moving as quickly as they can to electricity. So th those are success stories. But that still leaves manufacturing and, and the need to go an industry and the need to move as quickly as possible to a circular uh, e economy. And 3D printing is absolutely central to the transformation in that sector. Now, I'm not going to get into uh, regenerative agriculture uh, and uh, forestry management, uh, ocean management. These are all elements uh, of the same overall challenge. Uh, but 3D printing, without question, has an enormous uh, role to play in transforming manufacturing and industry uh, into a zero carbon uh, and circular model. And finally, we are in an interesting political moment, as the vice president suggested. We seem to be on the tipping point of having a real discussion mm. about making changes. We've been very focused on the supply side of technology today. If you could both wave your magic wand and implement a different demand regime around policies, what would most speed the adoption of these new technologies? First, Rick, and then we'll let Al finish. It's a very interesting point. I was involved in, in, my, in my last business. We made batteries for start-stop for automotive. And uh, we built the company that's today the market share leader. So when you get to the traffic light, your engine stops. And then it's used by most OEMs. And then we also made batteries for grid. We sold that business to NEC. And you know, today they have a, a fleet 
uh, that, that of 500 megawatt of batteries installed on the grid in many countries. So I think it's one of the largest fleets in the world. Um, and during that business, I, I helped uh, lobby. Uh, I was on the board of the EDTA and helped lobby and push for this $7,500 tax credit you get when you buy an electric vehicle here in the US. Uh, and in that business, it was very important to get those incentives to get it kick-started, and now the cost of batteries has come down, and mm -hmm. that was a really uh, successful political uh, partnership, pu public-private partnership. In 3D printing, I'm not sure we need incentives for adoption of the technology from the point of view of, of um, the, because the econ manufacturing is very economics-centric. You're not dealing with a consumer that is at a dealership trying to make decisions. It, you're, you're dealing with uh, really very clear-cut numbers. And we've designed a process that's cheaper than casting up to 100,000 units today, but it's following Moore's law for inkjet. Inkjet gets faster every 18 months. Yeah. And it's a semiconductor, you know, it's MEMS-based, uh, so that there's, there's a, a trend for the, you know, when Ellie was doing the original inkjet systems, it was, you know, single nozzle and very, very slow. Today, our, our heads have 30,000 nozzles and uh, they print at 100 kilohertz. They're doing 3 billion drops a second. So the technology gets faster every year. I, I, um, so I'm not sure we need a, a, a specific uh, uh, regulatory uh, structure to drive adoption. Um, but I, I uh, do hope that we don't have uh, barriers implemented as this technology starts to uh, make it more efficient and release productivity in the economy um, uh, because I think it's going to lead to, you know, this technology is going to lead to a lot of wealth creation globally, uh, not just for developed nations, but also democratizing the ability to make stuff for anybody around the world. And, uh, and that's actually, I think, a, a really great thing. Uh, today it's expensive, but we're going to make it affordable over time. I will let you have the last word. Well, in order to solve the, the climate crisis and the larger ecological crisis of which it's a part, we have to solve the democracy crisis. I spoke earlier uh, about the interplay between Earth Incorporated and the global mind. Uh, you could rephrase that in the U.S. context uh, as a discussion of the interplay between capitalism and democracy. Democratic capitalism, this uh, 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 dual ideology, has been uh, hegemonic in the world, particularly since 1989, really since before that. Uh, and, and yet uh, the fissures between the two halves of this ideology are now uh, growing. Uh, I'm a capitalist uh, uh, unapologetically, uh, but I think that we need reforms in capitalism in order to measure what have been conveniently labeled as externalities, not only well-known negative externalities like pollution, like global warming pollution, uh, which now captures as much extra heat energy in the Earth system every day as would be released by 500,000 Hiroshima-class atomic bombs exploding every 24 hours. It is literally insane mm. what we're doing. Uh, but we also need to, 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 to measure and capture positive externalities so that we end the chronic underinvestment in education and healthcare, et, et cetera. In order to accomplish this and heal this relationship between capitalism and democracy, we need better tools. Uh, we need, for example, a, a direct or indirect price on carbon pollution. That's the example most, oftenly cited, most often cited. But in order to accomplish that and the other changes that are critically necessary, we have to heal the operations of our democracy and get the toxic influence of big money out of the ability of people to think together collectively and make intelligent choices about our future. Right now, it is not working. It is failing us. Luckily, the, the rising generation is demanding a better world, uh, and I, I'm optimistic that we will see the emergence in, uh, in the networking world of new ways to facilitate the kind of collective thinking that will enable people to use the tools of democracy to fix 
the serious uh, problems in the marketplace. Does that mean that the spirit behind the Green New Deal, without pressing you about its specifics, is right? That you can't make real inroads on the climate crisis without fixing what you call the, the democracy recession? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, it's right. I know you've uh, written uh, critically about it, and uh, others have as well. I, I, I am generally uh, strongly in favor of what's described as the Green New Deal. Uh, but when you, you know, peel back the first layer and look at the specifics, sure, you're going to find some things that you disagree with, I disagree with. Mm -hmm. But let me give you another, let, let me give you an analogy. I know we're running past, yeah, but this please. is, this this is, is important. Good. Back in um, the late 70s and early 80s, in addition to working on the climate crisis, I spent a lot of time working on nuclear arms control. And I remember vividly um, when then candidate Governor Ronald Reagan uh, used uh, the phrase evil empire uh, in describing the then Soviet Union. The Soviet Union in 1980, this is ancient history, most of your employees weren't even born then. I'm <laughs> ever more aware of, uh, of no. that. Uh, but uh, pres then President Jimmy Carter was negotiating an arms control agreement with the Soviet Union. They invaded Afghanistan, different era. Um, we pulled out of the Olympics. Uh, the arms control agreement was pulled from consideration. Ronald Reagan coming on strong in the campaign that year started saying we've got to build more missiles and we've got to build up our nuclear arsenal. People got really apprehensive that maybe the nuclear arms race, which they had begun to relax about a little bit, all of a sudden was coming back strong. So here's the reason I'm telling you this. There was a popular movement called the nuclear freeze movement. And it spread so rapidly across the United States. People looked at the details and the experts in that field, and I considered myself by then uh, to have some claim to that label. I looked at it and went, oh my god, that's crazy. We can't just freeze everything. I mean, we, we need to do it much more uh, thoughtfully and precisely. And, but the people generally said, no. Nope. Uh, you, you, you experts, you, you people who've been managing this, uh, the hell with you. You're not doing very well. We're scared. Uh, time to get a hold on this. So let's have a nuclear freeze. And something like 80% of the American people, maybe I'm overstating, maybe it was maybe 75% of the American people came, said, told pollsters they're in favor of a nuclear freeze. Well, didn't come to pass, but it created such enormous political pressure that, among other things, it, 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 it led President Reagan, after he became president, to actually completely change his approach in Reykjavik and then later on. Uh, and some of us worked with him. We got a brand new approach that sharply reduced uh, nuclear weapons. But, but this, this label, a nuclear freeze, criticized as simplistic was a very powerful expression of the American people that changed history. Now, Green New Deal. What it encompasses is two things. We need to solve the climate crisis, and we have the opportunity to create tens of millions of new jobs. Bureau of Labor Statistics tell what's the fastest growing job in the United States? Solar installer. Over the last five years, solar jobs have grown six times faster than average job growth. What's the second fastest growing job? Wind turbine technician. What's by far the biggest job opportunity? Retrofitting the built environment, buildings, residential, business, commercial, industrial, in every community across the United States in ways that, pay f that pays for itself because in, in the form of much uh, reduced uh, energy bills, and you create tens of millions of jobs. Okay, so. You call it simplistic, you can call it naive, but the American people get it. And that's why in overwhelming percentages, they're saying, yeah, we're for a Green New Deal. Now you work out the details. And I'm hopeful and I'm optimistic because we have seen this sustainability revolution already 
creating much more attractive alternatives to the dirty, dangerous, reckless, polluting processes of the past, uh, and we can create new jobs in the process. Ladies and gentlemen, Al Gore. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.